Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to talk here uh, in this workshop. And uh, so the title was already announced. So this is uh, joint work with my PhD student, Lukas Hallekotte, and with a student of Tamas Thiel from the University of Budapest, and his uh, name is Balint Kosash. And so the talk is also divided more or less in two uh, topics, which both deal said, with uh, multi-stable systems. So now for an introduction, of course, so we look at tipping phenomena. Uh, so, and together with resilience, you will uh, immediately learn why we do that. And uh, as we heard here in several talks, so uh, tipping phenomena are usually thought of as relative sudden changes of a system state under the influence of changes in, say, environmental conditions or external forcing, possibly related to crossing some threshold, but not necessarily. So the general approach which is developed now uh, is dealing with critical transitions, so which can be of different kind. As an example from ecology, because I'm from a marine institute, so uh, I picked here so the example of a collapse of a coral reef. So where you have before the critical transition, you have here, so to say, the um, coral reef which is intact, and then after the transition, so it's overgrown by algae. Now, uh, tipping phenomena is an old phenomenon in, in a certain way, so because it has developed in different uh, disciplines of science, even with different names in ecology, so these kind of transitions are called regime shifts in mathematics, so they are often related to instabilities. And in climate science and also in mathematics now, so it's related with tipping points. But there is another theory which has also been developed um, quite some time ago is the theory of resilience and uh, so which talks about the uh, ability of a system to return to its state and uh, after a perturbation. And both of them are more or less in, in a certain way uh, two sides of the same coin because a resilient system would not go into instabilities or tipping uh, phenomena or regime shifts, but it would balance, so to say, perturbations. Now, the problem we are studying is, of course, how do we analyze such tipping phenomena and what methods are in principle suitable for the system if it is high dimensional, so which most of the systems in Earth system science are, and or highly multistable, because many of these works which deal with uh, tipping phenomena and critical transitions assume that we have two alternatives only. So, but uh, the general approach, of course, would think that we have much more than uh, two stable states and we could have more of them. And this could uh, complicate our life, so to say, when studying critical transitions. Now, a very important point, uh, which I'm uh, going to address in this uh, talk here is related with basins of attraction. Therefore, I would like to um, introduce this concept, even though many of you will know it, of course. So, which is uh, illustrated by this kind of uh, cartoon here. So we have two stable states. Now it's also bistable only. And then the set of initial conditions, which all converge to the same state, would be called the basin of attraction. And uh, if you have lots of different attractors, lots of different stable states coexisting, so then uh, your uh, basins of attraction do not have to look very simple, so as it would be here. So we, this would be smooth basin boundaries, so the boundaries where you go from one stable state to another one when you cross this kind of boundary uh, would be quite simple uh, because it would be stable manifolds of an unstable fixed point or a periodic orbit here. But it can also be fractal basin boundaries as we see them here. And then it's related with transient chaos because chaotic saddles are embedded in these fractal structures here, which cause additional difficulties, as we will see in analyzing critical transitions. Now, so when we look at these critical transitions, then we also have to think about the role of the perturbations because not only in critical transitions, but also in resilience theory, people talk about 
perturbations. And uh, so what kind of perturbations are important? This is the question. Of course, in reality, we would have uh, um, perturbations which contain different kinds of parts, say, so because it could be perturbations on the state variables and it could be perturbations on the forcing or the parameters. So this is basically illustrated with this kind of view graph here. So where we use the cartoon picture more or less, which is for alternative stable states over and over used so that we have a bistability here. And this, these would be the steady states, for instance, and the state variables, and here are the parameters. But then perturbations can be of different kinds, because either you, you perturb your state variables, then you go practically here, so to say, vertically, and you have to overcome uh, so this hill, which was seen in the previous slide, so that we have, so to say, to overcome the boundary of the basin of attraction to get to this state. But when we change parameters, we change the whole stability landscape. And that means this kind of, of uh, potential landscape here will change. And finally, so we will go over this cliff here and uh, uh, end up in this other stable state here. So the perturbations could, could be, of course, fluctuations. It could be single perturbations, just one single kick of the system, or it could be trends. And uh, so most of them uh, apply either to the parameter changes or to changes in the state variables. The two first to the state variables, basically the trends are usually the ones which apply here, but it could also be a little bit more difficult, of course. Now, possible tipping mechanisms have been already, so to say, discussed here in uh, this meeting. And in principle, there is this wonderful uh, classification which uh, was contributed by Peter Ashwin and co-workers. Uh, so where we have bifurcation induced tipping or B tipping, where we go basically over a bifurcation, we have noise tipping, which is a noise induced transition. But then we can also have an S tipping, which is a shock tipping. Uh, that we have a single large perturbation, which brings us over the basin boundary. Or it could be also trends, as I uh, mentioned before. And then if, if these trends are too far, uh, too fast, so then we come up with rate-induced tipping. That means parameter changes, which change with a trend, would be faster than the system can track its stable state. So this classification, uh, so to say, contains all the four possibilities, but I will concentrate here only on methods on the last two on S-tipping and R-tipping. And what I would like to bring to your attention is two kind of uh, possible methods how to study these kind of transitions, shock-induced and uh, rate-induced uh, transitions in a highly multi-stable system. And one of the ideas, uh, so how one can uh, study these kind of shock tippings was already formulated by Bas Holling a long time ago, because he came up with this idea in the resilience theory, so that ecological resilience is the smallest perturbation which is necessary to perturb the system in such a way that it can leave the current ecosystem state and causes a regime shift or a critical transition. Now, when we formulate it in a mathematical way, so then it, uh, it is nothing else than computing the smallest distance to the basin boundary. And then, so to say, if you apply this perturbation, you get out of the basin of attraction and you end up with a different state. And this uh, computation of the smallest distance to the boundary is quite simple if you have a low dimensional system. But it's not that simple if you have a high dimensional system. Then you need uh, you need special methods because you cannot probe every direction in a high dimensional system and see how far it is to get to the basin of attraction. And additionally, so to say, you can have this kind of fractal structures here, even having uh, chaotic sandals embedded in them. And then you are interested basically in this distance, because if you are out of this open neighborhood of the attractor, so to say, in this area here, then you cannot predict to any of the, uh, of the stable states you can go. 
Now, one can do this, and uh, so I'm not going into mathematical details here, but uh, so there is an optimization method which you can use, and in principle, it's inspired by a method which is used in hydrodynamics, which is called the minimal seed, and uh, it looks for the smallest perturbation which is necessary to go from a laminar to a turbulent flow. And this can be adapted to the question we are asking here. And uh, it has to be an optimization scheme because as I noticed already or noted already, we cannot probe any direction in state space, but we have to optimize this. And we have dynamical constraints because we have to fulfill the dynamic equations, but we also have to fulfill another constraint. So which is the closest distance, so to say, to the basin boundary. Now to do so, we can do it. And so just to give you an idea so that this is going to work, uh, I will uh, here discuss an example so of a plant pollinator network. It's a, an example from ecology. And these are networks of plant species and uh, pollinator species, which are interacting with each other to their mutual benefit. And uh, so these, um, these plant pollinator networks are really having a network structure. So because as you see, so to say, different pollinators uh, interact with different plants. So that means we have a network structure which can be uh, sufficiently complicated and it's a high dimensional system. And you have a highly multi-stable system too, because so the wanted state is of course where all the uh, pollinators and plants are alive, but there are many other states here. So where some of the pollinators and some of the plants are have died out. So you see there are lots of different topologies in these networks. So ranging from strong core networks to a mixture of strong cores with some kind of tree-like structures and tree-like networks. And what do we get with looking at this minimal shock? Uh, so which leads practically at the, the very end to the um, extinction of species of certain species is exemplified with one of the networks here, which we have seen uh, already previously is the most unstable one because so this minimal fatal shock is a vector. It's a vector in state space and we have a magnitude of it. That means a norm of this vector and we have a direction. And that means this is the most unstable network and the direction is now visualized with these colors which give us the perturbations to the different species which have to be uh, put on it to basically destabilize the network and bring some of the species to extinction. And uh, so this is what you can do for uh, many different kinds of networks and what is the advantage here is really you can figure out the direction and the direction tells you what are the most vulnerable parts of your system. And this is an information which comes in addition to getting, so to say, this magnitude. In addition, you find what are vulnerable states for this kind of networks. It's just that we have only one bond here and this is a threat for all the tree-like structure, which is not really closely related to the core of the network. So this is one of the possibilities to look at uh, this kind of shock induced tipping. Now I come to the rate induced tipping, which is also in highly multi-stable systems quite relevant. Because when you have a highly multi-stable system, then you have in general also a complex bifurcation diagram. That means in, in terms of the dependence on parameters, you have many coexisting states and the basins of attraction of those coexisting states are usually having fractal and complexly interwoven uh, basins of attraction, as we have seen in one of the slides before. And uh, in addition, so these systems possess usually also a lot of parameter ranges with either permanent or transient chaos. And this is now uh, becoming important when analyzing rate-induced tipping in those kind of systems. And I will immediately uh, tell you how the rate-induced tipping we are looking at is, so to say, structured. When we look at these kind of things, so usually, so we sweep through the bifurcation diagram. That means we assume in the literature, most of the, uh, of the um, literature assumes that, that the external drivers or parameters are quite slow. And so therefore it's a kind of quasi-static approach. We are really going through this bifurcation diagram. 
But what happens when the rate is much faster? So what do we see when the rate of change of the drivers or parameters come is comparable with the time scale of internal dynamics? Let's have a look at a simple system. It's a pendulum where we have a suspension which is periodically forced here. And this would be the static bifurcation diagram. So the forcing amplitude is here our parameter and we would have multi-stability here, we would have chaos here, another uh, region of multi-stability here. And so we start with this chaotic motion and we just switch off the driving. So finally we have to end up in, in, uh, at rest. So because if there's no driving uh, anymore, so to say this pendulum would be at rest. But of course, so to say, we are going through this area of multi-stability. What do we see? So when we are switching off exponentially the driving. Now, so the chaotic attractor we start with is this one. And this brings me to the method how to deal with this, because I can compute this chaotic attractor in two different ways. I can either take a long trajectory and plot Poincaré sections, or I can also do it in taking a large ensemble of trajectories, start them in the same way and compute them all in parallel. Then I would also get this kind of attractor. And so this is in climate science, for instance, referred to an internal variability so that we have this kind of uh, complex structure and the switching off can now start in principle from any of those infinitely many starting points on the attractor. What happens is the following, and ah, no, I should mention before, so to say that this ensemble method um, is a method which has been introduced to analyze random dynamical systems. And so the method we are using is called a snapshot attractors, which is developed in physics. But there is another one in mathematics, which is pullback attractors, which does basically the same thing. And loosely speaking, I would say one slice at a certain time instant of the pullback attractor is in fact the snapshot attractor. But for physicists, it's much easier, so to say, to look at these ensembles of, of trajectories and look at these snapshot attractors. And this is what we do. And now analyze, so to say, the switching of process. And so we start here, we go backwards. Who? No, no, this should not happen. Uh, so we go backwards and look what we would see in a switching off with two different rates here at this point. So we are just starting here and now uh, switch off our driving and look what the system looks like. And so these are the different, um, the different speeds with which we switch off the driving. The snapshot attractor, which is now the set of initial conditions which we all integrate together with this switching of process. And the attractors which we should see in the frozen in case, that means in the bifurcation diagram, are shown here. And we see that the dynamics does not reflect at all uh, what is shown in the bifurcation diagram. So what we see is not these period two orbits here, so, but what we see is high variability. We still see, so to say, a remnant of this chaotic attractor, even though it looks very different. And a close analysis would show up that this is a time dependent chaotic saddle, which is basically embedded in the basin boundaries. So this is what we would see. So we would not see what's going on in the bifurcation diagram. So, but we would see something completely different, which is related to the chaos, to the permanent chaos here, but even more importantly to the transient chaos, which lives here on the basin boundary. And what we would expect here, if we go slowly through a bifurcation diagram would be B tipping, but there's no B tipping observed here. So, because it's all hidden by the chaos. Two minutes. We can also go. Sorry. Two minutes. Uh, yeah, uh, we can also go in the different direction. So we start now from here uh, in, in the bifurcation diagram and go in this direction. But now we are not going as far as here. So to get here, but we are only going through the first bifurcation, where a saddle node bifurcation gives rise to another um, two periodic orbits. So this is here in the Poincaré section. We uh, start first, so with uh, having a constant uh, value of C. So then we are going, so to say, from here to here. 
and then it's again constant. And tipping means now that a trajectory changes its basin of attraction due to the ramping. So because here it's monostable, so all the initial conditions would go to this point. But if we take now a set of initial conditions, say, which covers the whole uh, state space here and do the ramping and we ask where we end up with, it depends on the rate of change. Where do we end up and how do our basins of attraction look like? For very, very slow ramping, of course, we should see only one basin of attraction. Everything should have been contracted here and that's it. But if we do it comparable with uh, the internal dynamics, we should see different basins of attraction popping up. So this would be a step-like function. So we are just jumping here from one parameter value to the next one. So we see the bistability popping up, but so the slower we go, so to say, the less we see it. That means this is also a kind of rate induced transition because for a slow rate, we don't see any change in basins of attraction, but for a fast rate, we do see it. And this is partial because for every initial condition, it tips at a different point. And this brings me to the summary of my talk here. So, so we have these four uh, different kinds of critical transitions here, but it becomes very much interesting also when we look not only at two different states, so where we have the possibility only to have a choice between two alternatives, but uh, the situation becomes much more involved if you have lots of uh, these different attractors coming up and you have really to think about what are the perturbations uh, uh, you deal with. And the two I have discussed here are the shop ticket tipping where you have only one particular uh, perturbation where not only the magnitude is important, but much more important is the direction in state space where you perturb the system. And then you end up with another attractor and the relation between internal uh, time scales and driver or parameter time scales for changes play a fundamental role and lead to rate induced uh, transitions of very different kind, not only the ones we have seen so far in the um, uh, in the presentations here, but also uh, concerning the basins of attraction. Thank you very much. So